Okay, so um, we've been doing a lot of this just sort of like proof of concept uh, to get our feet wet to confirm that this works. Um, we're going to spend a lot of time writing code, of course, mostly JavaScript. What I want to do is get a little bit of practice um, with writing some JavaScript for the for the project here to take in, to take advantage of the plugins that we have access to. So uh, open up your web browser, any one that you like, and let's go to the official documentation where the where the plugins are, where where Cordova is. So it's cordova.apache.org. We've seen this site before briefly, but this is now the in this class part two where we're going to spend even more time. So cordova.apache.org. When we clicked in Visual Studio to show me more info about a plugin, it simply opened the web browser in Visual Studio to this. Um, so that if you still have that open, that web browser, there is a web browser in Visual Studio. I can go in here and you know, go over here and, and go look at the latest movies if I wanted. So there is a web browser built into Visual Studio. But obviously I want to use a real web browser because I don't want to get distracted on looking at the latest movies. Oh, look at that. Tribute to Steve Ditko. So um, here on the web browser, uh, I want to go look at the documentation for uh, playing with a little bit of Cordova. Uh, I want to see, well, maybe something like how do I make a sound in my app? So I'll go to documentation. There's several chapters about setting yourself up, setting yourself an, up in Android, talking about icons. Some of this won't relate exactly one-to-one -one in Visual Studio because Cordova is like the basic foundation that a lot of other people build on top of. Microsoft, using Visual Studio, builds on top of it to create sort of their version of Cordova. Intel has their own version of Visual Studio called XDK that sort of also builds on top of Cordova. And um, all of these other sort of companies borrow and expand upon the core of Cordova. So whatever documentation you see here might not really say, click here in Visual Studio to do that. Because this is like the generic instructions for everyone. But scrolling down on the left all the way to the plugins, let's say I want to play with, um, let's, let's do vibration. I want to make the project, I want to make the, the device vibrate. So use case scenarios for that is you get a high score, it vibrates to let you know, or maybe in our, um, maybe in our comic book app, why or when might we make it vibrate in our CBDB app? Well, something, new. something new pops up to tell you something, sure. Maybe when we delete a comic to give you some feedback, it worked, or just to alert you. So this is a different type of feedback. But let's go check out how vibration works. So click on vibration, then it has some sub-chapters. It tells you at the top here just some really nerdy stuff about what version of the plugin is it currently working or not. Because this stuff is constantly being updated. Uh, constantly being improved. Cordova is a global project with people all over the world contributing to this open source project. Remember when we had the discussion on copyrights? All of this Cordova is basically open source. They put it out there for free for the world to use. You can use it how you want. You don't have to give them any royalties. You don't have to sign a license agreement. Basically you use it as is to your projects. Your projects can be free, can be paid. You can use this how you want. Uh, this basically says, okay, um, navigator.vibrate. All this extra stuff here, sometimes we care about it, sometimes we don't. But notice what this is saying. Document.eventless, add event listener, device ready. That looks familiar. That's already inside of our template file. Then we've got a function on device ready. When the device tells our app it's ready, run a function on device ready right here. Once the device is ready, uh, vibrate. So this particular plugin is pretty easy to work with. If we wanted to install it uh, via the, the 
basic Cordova method, we have to type the command Cordova plugin add Cordova plugin vibration. But we're using Visual Studio. So we need to install it through Visual Studio. Let's go back to Visual Studio. Let's go back to where we install plugins, which is where? Config XML. And then in the plugin screen, and we need to find the vibration plugin. Vibration. It's telling us here if you were using the command prompt, which is another way to um, to do Cordova, typing commands like in DOS, you would type Cordova plugin add this plugin. Well, in Visual Studio, we go to the right screen, and here is Cordova plugin vibration. We could just click add. Go ahead and add that plug-in vibration. It'll connect back to the Cordova mothership. It will then add itself to our project. Now we have the ability to do vibration in our app. Further reading the documentation. Okay. Supported. This works on Android, iOS, and Windows. It doesn't work on Blackberries. Well, no one uses Blackberries anymore, so who cares? But the other sorts of platforms out there that exist, like a Kindle and such, I don't see it on the list, so maybe it doesn't work on Kindle. So this is something to be aware of, that these plugins that we're going to see, not everyone works in every platform, but like 98% of them do. Because almost every device, Windows, iOS, Kindle, Android, whatever, they have the same things, a camera. Uh, file system, vibration, etc. Vibrate. This function has three different functionalities based on parameters passed to it. Standard vibration. Navigator.vibrate time or navigator.vibrate time. This looks exactly the same. What's the difference? Square brackets. Anyone know what square brackets in JavaScript means? An array. An array of objects, perhaps. So, if you don't know that, we'll get to it, no problem. But um, here's a possibility of adding one set of time, one amount of time, or different sets of time. So, time is a variable or parameter in milliseconds. How many seconds is one millisecond? 1,000 milliseconds is one second. So we need to do this in, in increments of thousands. If I want this to vibrate for one whole second, it's 1,000 milliseconds. So we need to think in terms of milliseconds, not plain old seconds. If I put a 1 there, it'll vibrate in 1 1,000th one of a second, which basically not at all. But the documentation is going to be very much like this, that it shows you an example of code in <coughs> gray, and often it'll have options, and then an explanation of what the options are, and then an actual example. So to, to write it here, 3 seconds vibration, navigator.vibrate, parentheses, 3000. So we have the navigator JavaScript object, which is basically the app. The app object method, dot vibrate, parentheses. So it's a method with a parameter, 3000 milliseconds being one second. Cause a vibration of three seconds. Depending on the documentation, depending on the plugin, that is, there's going to be different um, there's going to be different uh, quirks or specific things. Um, apparently on iOS we cannot tell it how long to vibrate. Even if we say vibrate for three seconds, it'll vibrate to the built-in amount of time that iOS, that Apple, has decided. If we're on uh, <coughs> Windows, yes. <coughs> yes. Some reason that Steve Jobs enshrined that no one will ever change is that, uh, yeah, for whatever reason, for user experience, we believe three seconds is perfect, so anything less or more than that is horrible for the user. So that's what 
one thing to be aware of on, on iOS. But it might not be a big deal for most of us, but just something to be aware of, and it's in the documentation. Uh, for Windows, a maximum size of 5 seconds. Uh, so you can't make this vibrate for 8 seconds. For Android, uh, called Navigator Vibrate will immediately return false if user hasn't tapped on the frame. Okay, well, anyway, here's another way to do it. Vibrate with a pattern. Android and Windows only. So again, because iOS is only going to vibrate a certain amount of time, it's going to ignore this. It will vibrate, but it will ignore this. And here's where the array comes in. An array is a sequence or a collection of numbers. So we're saying here, vibrate for one second, comma, then vibrate for a second, comma, then vibrate for three, then vibrate for one more second, and then vibrate for five seconds. So a pattern. And we can have as many values as we want here, but it'll only work on Android and Windows devices. We can cancel a vibration in the middle of all of this with vibrate zero, but not supported in iOS. So um, this code that we're going to write again, it's like 98% compatible on all devices. There's a couple things here and there that are quirks that you just read about and, and adhere to. So we've installed the plugin. We want to write the code. All of this Cordova code is basically JavaScript code. Let's get back to Visual Studio. Let's open our index.js file. Inside of the scripts folder, you will find index.js. Here's our JavaScript file. The HTML file is all for the structure of things, the CSS file for the visuals of design, and the JS for the interactivity. The documentation in, visual in Cordova was basically saying you're going to write your code, although in the global scope they are not available until after device is ready. This is trying to say that this plugin, and basically all of the plugins, should exist in an on-device ready function. That's what we have already in our template. When our app starts, it'll start reading our code from top to bottom. It'll wait for the device to communicate back to our app, we're ready. Then it'll launch device ready. And basically, all of the code that our app needs to be about needs to be in on device ready. Other stuff outside of it, um, it's basically you have to have the Cordova code in on device ready. Uh, because the, the reason for that might be we're trying to use vibration. But the Cordova code hasn't loaded into the memory yet. We know the Cordova code is loaded into memory once device ready happens, once device ready event fires, once the device tells our app it's ready. So anywhere inside of on device ready, we can start writing this code. I'm going to write it before the end of on device ready, which is line 21, 22. So give yourself a couple of empty spaces before the end of the curly brace of on device ready. And you know, they're not doing the thing that we're doing, being good coders and noting our ending of our functions and such. That's optional. But I want to lose track of what that is, because we're going to have like 700 lines of code in this thing. So this is optional. And again, this test file, we're going to delete it today. We're not even going to keep it. We're just playing with it. But it's good practice as we've been doing to name the ending of our functions. <clears throat> Navigator. Again, as we're typing, it may pop up to suggest stuff. And this autocomplete is in Notepad++. Remember, we had it off. And if the, if the pop-up happens, you can double-click the code, or you can press Tab for it to finish typing for you. But again, be careful because as, as I'm typing NAV, it means oh, do you need do you need do you mean navigator type, navigator beacon? No, I mean navigator. But what about capital navigator? No, I mean lowercase navigator. Tab dot. You get a pop up of even more stuff, and it's simply navigator dot vibrate. Vibrate. Again, as this pops up here. 
It may also give you even more tips. Navigator.vibrate works with a pattern, which is a number. Vibrate, parentheses, semicolon. That's the complete basic command. Use the Cordova JavaScript code to vibrate the device for three and one half seconds. For three and a half seconds, I want my device to vibrate. What's the number here? 3,500. 3,000 milliseconds is one second. Half a second then is 500 milliseconds. Three and a half seconds, 3,500 milliseconds. I'm going to save it. I'm going to run it, F5. Now I want to see if my device vibrates. Now this may be anticlimactic. I don't remember if these things even vibrate, if they have the capability. We'll see. I know, I know my other device over here does vibrate. Did yours vibrate? <clears throat> Uh, that's odd. Did anyone else get that kind of message? Yeah. Really? Hmm. Oh, here it is. Block call to here because user hasn't tapped on the frame or any embedded frame yet. What is that saying? Hmm. Maybe this particular device that you're all borrowing, maybe it doesn't have vibration. So, let's do a different plugin. Let's do sound. This thing should have sound. I'm going to stop that. Yeah, let's stop that. OK, we want to do sound. OK, vibration, I guess maybe these things don't do vibration. So let me comment. Let's comment out the line there, because uh, maybe I want to delete it, maybe not. But we'll comment it out. Use Cordova to play a sound. Notification. So the idea is that I want to um, uh, use uh, Cordova to play some sound uh, before I then do any Cordova features. I need the Cordova plugin. Um, so in the documentation. I'm browsing around here. We've got camera, device, media, status, etc. This one, this one doesn't um, make sense, but it's actually under dialogues because we've got the ability to do alerts, confirms, prompts, and beeps. So I just want like a little beep sound. So inside of the dialogues, inside of dialog, we're going to make our app beep. Well, this requires us to have Cordova plugin dialog plugin. So in Visual Studio, config XML. Dialogs is under here, notifications. Cordova plugin dialogs. So in Visual Studio, we have to add this particular plugin to do notifications in terms of alerts, pop ups, and sound feedback. So we'll add that and we'll see, okay, 
So step one, basically, I add the plugin. Step two, I write the code based on the documentation. I want a beep. So navigator.notification beep. The way it works is I write navigator.notification.beep. And how many beeps? This works on Android, in the web browser apparently, iOS and Windows 8. Quirks in Android. Android plays the default note the default notification ringtone. So in Visual Studio, in our index.js file, seems to be working. After our note right there, uh, right here, navigator dot notification dot b two. Fractions won't work on this, but let's do three. I want this to beep three times. I want it to play the sound built into the device three times. So I know that when I write code here, I, I have a habit like right away I save it. So on mine, these are going to be green almost always because I write my code and I save it right away. Remember, wherever you make any changes, it'll be yellow until you save. My habit is to write the code, save the code right away. And then F5. Seems to be working there, too. So give that a try. Navigator.notification.beep3. So most of us are going to have the same sound, and that, and it's changeable. And then when you use your own device, well, it's going to play your device's sound. And there it went. Three for me. This is all happening automatically after device is ready. Obviously, we will set these things up to be triggered once there's a button press and such. And again, the, the annoying thing for me is that this does not clear itself out between compilations. I would try to remember to clear it before you stop your debugging. So that one worked. That one does. These devices do have sound capabilities. So I played a sound. <clears throat> now that we've confirmed we've got sound, let's mute our devices. You can press the volume button on the top here to go to zero. Well, the thing about dialogue is that it also lets you do other things, such as a prompt. Remember, we had the prompt. Oh, no, actually, let's do confirm. Remember, we did confirm for um, CBDB, where we're in the app, and then we want to log out, and a little pop-up happened. That pop-up for, for confirm from our switch was the default built-in JavaScript one. Well, we've got what would you what you would call more native uh, dialogues these are going to be pop-ups that happen that look more like they belong in the device the JavaScript built-in confirm and prompt and all of that are gonna look pretty generic but I want those to look like it actually looks properly on an iPhone or an Android device so we've got these built-in ones and looking at the documentation displays a customizable confirmation box navigator dot notification dot confirm and we've got the message which is a string which is going to be in quotes a confirm callback callback to invoke with index of button pressed 
or when the dialog is dismissed. This is going to be a function, title, button labels, title, dialog title, string, optional, defaults to confirm. So if I don't put that option, a pop-up will happen that it's called confirm at the top. I could make it be anything else I want as a, as a string in quotes. The buttons, the default, are going to be labeled OK and canceled. I can name them how I want, like great or nope. I can name them how I want, and these are optional. So what also shows here in square brackets often also means optional. These are required. What's the message? What happens after the person clicks confirm? So the way, the way I want to do this is a little more complex. I want to uh, create this pop-up that appears on screen, and when someone clicks OK or cancel, something else happens, like maybe the vibration. So I don't want it, I mean the, the, the sound. I don't want it to play the sound until I've clicked OK or cancel. So we've got the ability to confirm already. It comes from the dialog plugin. If I scroll further down, here's an example. Navigator.notification confirmed they broke it into multiple lines. Um, what's the message that appears? You are the winner, comma. On confirm, this is the name of the function that will run after they press the button. So it'll jump back here. Alert. You selected whatever. The name on the top of the box will be game over. And the buttons will say restart or exit. Just, for, just to see this in action, let's copy this example as is, see how it looks, and then change it for our purposes. So inside of the Navigator notification confirm, let's select this example, all the code. Don't forget the final parenthesis right here. Copy this whole chunk of code. Back to Visual Studio. All of this Cordova code must exist inside of your on-device ready. So before on-device ready ends, give yourself some space and paste it. So navigator.notification.confirm. We'll get a pop-up saying that message. When they click, uh, when they click restart or exit, that'll happen. Message on top. The buttons are going to be called restart or exit instead of cancel and OK. The defaults. You'll jump back to this function. It'll do a basic alert. It'll say you selected, and it'll tell us which button the person clicked on, the first one or the second one. All of this is just out here without any interactivity, so it'll just happen as soon as the app launches. Uh, let's Before we play it, uh, let's um, move the beep code to be inside of the on confirm. Cut it and paste it into confirm. We don't want the sound to play, and you can turn up your volume now, I guess, if you want to hear it. Uh, but we don't want the sounds to play until the person does the confirmation here. So I moved it from I moved dot beep from outside of a function into the onconfirm function. I have all of this code I haven't saved yet. Go ahead and save it and run it. As soon as my app starts, I get a pop-up, which looks like an Android-style pop-up. It's got the basic default colors and fonts of Android. If I were running this on iOS, it would have the basic design and colors and style of iOS. I get then the button Restart and Exit. Well, that's exactly what I have listed here, Restart and Exit. Uh, at the top of the box, it says game over. Well, that's what's there, game over. And then the message being said, you are the winner, which is right there. Uh, either of the ones I click on will then take me to the on confirm function. 
I'll just click restart. You heard three beeps, hopefully. A new pop-up happened in alert, which doesn't look too much like Android. It's dark and the font's weird and stuff, because that one is not the native alert. It's the basic built-in alert. But it did the three beeps. It said you selected, and then in my case, one, because I clicked button number one. I click OK on that. Then the app continues. I'm going to stop that and go back. I can play with this to do other things. Instead of saying you are the winner, let's say, do you wish to exit? Question. Instead of it saying game over, we'll say log out. Instead of it saying restart, we'll say stay. Instead of exit, we'll say quit. Just changing totally basic aspects of it. The functionality is exactly the same. Create a confirmation box. Uh, I change the messages that happen, but in the result of whatever they clicked on, confirms happened here. Well, there's stay, there's quit options, but either of the ones you click on still will run one function on confirm. There isn't an, there isn't an on exit, function exit, or function stay. I mean, there's no function quit, no function stay. Only one function runs from either of these. So how would, how would a person deal with each of these being selected. There's these two conditions. How do we how would we deal with that? An if else or a switch inside of on confirm. If else Well, it's good practice here. And um, on confirm function and if else picking the button. So we've got two possibilities, stay and quit. So obviously, if I write if stay, Nope. <clears throat> that's, that's what the person would think, but not what the computer would think. This keeps track of stay or quit by button index, which is simply one or two. Also notice, it might be really small, but there should be like a little green line, squiggly line, between your parentheses. If you hover your mouse over it, expression expected. So it's going to give you sort of like feedback and troubleshooting on the fly as best as it can. It can't troubleshoot everything. But this is saying you're missing something in the if-else. <clears throat> so I want to check. Was it, was it stay or quit? But one is one, one is two. Actually, let me confirm here in the documentation. Is it 0 and 1, or is it? Oh yeah, here it is. So the values are 1 or 2. Sometimes it's going to start from 0. So read the documentation. In here, uh, it looks like it's 1 based. So the first button is a 1. The second button is a 2. If you have more buttons, it's a 3. That's good. So we want to confirm. Did they press 1? Did they press 2? If they pressed 1, they meant stay. If they pressed 2, they meant quit. So console. log 
one they want to stay. Console, so again, autocorrect or autocomplete. I'm, I just type con, I see console already highlighted, I can press tab, completes it. Dot log, again, I can have it completed for me. And then it pops up, well, a log is usually a message. So then I start the quote, it ends the quote for me too, semicolon. They want to quit. This is how I can account for these two possibilities when I only have one function that is going to run. Only one, because when they were inventing Cordova, that's what they decided. So we have to follow the documentation, and then we can, <coughs> we can then uh, alter it as we wish. So anyone have an idea possibly what our if might be here? How are we checking one or two? Not true or false, sorry. Say that, say that one more time. Close. That's a little too wordy, but close. It's going to be about something about one. Mm -hmm. Button index. Button index. This button index, when this, this is, it's, it's not obvious, but reading the documentation, you, you see how it's obvious. What happens when someone clicks stay or quit, a confirm will happen. And so um, that is going to get sent back to on confirm button index. We're passing the data of which one did they choose. This is all automatic. We don't have to write anything for it. It automatically will take either one or two and send it, pass it into confirm right here, button index. This is how we saw a moment ago. You selected button one because button index is storing the value one. So here we're checking if button index equals one. They picked one stay, they want to stay. Or else they must have picked not one, which is two. So else kicks in, they want to quit. So so uh, that's what you would be seeing here. The callback takes the argument button index, which is a number, which is the index of the press button. Note that the index is one-based indexing, so the value is 1, 2, etc. And we saw from the example, when we tested it without any modifications, you selected 1. So then we say, if that equals 1, it must mean they want to stay. So I'll run it. This is going to the console. It's not going to appear on screen. Visual Studio has a console. Especially if we're running on a device, we're not using the <coughs> browser's console, right? We've got a console right here in Visual Studio. I'm going to click the stay. It's doing the noise. And then the console output would appear there. They want to stay. Now I have to further click OK to close that. They want to stay. I'm going to refresh it. This time I'll press the other button. So it only asks you the question when you run the project the first time uh, because it's there's no trigger to make that happen. But OK, I'm going to, again, I'm going to clean my console here because it remembers the last thing I did. This time I'll press Quit. On screen it says, you entered 2. When I click that final OK, then the console says they want to quit. On line 33 of my index.js file, column 24. So instead of seeing the two, like you chose button two, then 
It's not that they don't know what it'll be. It tells you here it will be this. Because once you've got your first button, it has to be 1, whatever you call it. Second button will have to be 2. So it's always going to be these fixed positions. If we had something else, a different, a third button, well, it would be 3 and so forth. So I, I think we can read what was the text. But it's already based on index values of 1 through whatever. So we just know that the first button is this, the second button is that. OK, so I press the second button, number 2. The pop-up said, you pick number 2. But then in my JavaScript, I'm translating that, something human readable. If they press the first button, that must mean they want to stay, or else they must have not pressed the first button, the second button, so else kicks in. Regardless, then, it, it plays. Maybe I only want to play the sound once they've confirmed, OK, they want to stay. Hooray. So you don't have to do this. But I'm moving here now the, uh, the, the sound into the result of staying. Just cutting, cutting and pasting that into the if true, they did want to stay. Button index does equal 1. They want to stay. Hooray, play three beeps. Um, or else they don't want to play. They don't want to stay. OK, well, let's, let's annoy them and let's play 33 beeps. Well, that's too many, just five. We'll show you for trying to quit. So you see again, this is what I keep saying about building blocks. Literally here, pretty much, these Cordova plugins, I want to learn how to do, I mean, I want to use camera in my app. So I'll turn on the camera plugin and I'll write the code for it. I want to do sound, I want to do uh, checking contacts on the device. So the pieces, then I put them together to, to do what I want. So it's mostly going to be JavaScript that we're going to write. And then behind the scenes, Visual Studio will convert it to the right platform. So basically, our app then got turned into Java and then put on an Android device. If we had this all set up for iOS, it would then convert over to Objective-C and go on an, Android, on an iOS device. But we're going to be writing JavaScript. That's the thing that we care about. Therefore, we need to make sure our JavaScript code works and so forth. Let me show you the very super useful tool built into Visual Studio to help us do to, to help us confirm that our code works. Let's do this first of all. Let's click this save all button. We've been opening different files. If you don't save all your files, they don't they don't update, right? So do save all. And then uh, we can do uh, then close each of the files you have open. Just close the tabs for each of them. So make sure you save it, close the tabs. We're staying in Visual Studio, but just close all the tabs for a moment. All the tabs. Open up the index.js one more time. I want to show you two things. One is that all of the highlighting that was happening here of where I had changed and saved goes away between sessions of having the file open. That's very common in many editors. It does not remember from day to day or session to session what you've changed. So now when I start to change stuff here, it'll mark where you've changed it. And also, if you notice on the right side over here, this representation over here, that blue line is where your cursor is at, right there. And the green is where you've changed it. So if I go down here and click over here, notice the blue line changes here. You get, a, you get a relative view about where throughout all of your code, where your cursor is at, the blue line, and where you've made changes. 
where you've made changes also that haven't been saved. So I made a little bit of a change up here and down here, but I didn't save it there. My cursor is over here. I saved. But when I close it and open it, all of that goes away. Just be aware of that. No more of the markers of what I had changed. The other thing I want to show you is this. Go up to the View menu and select, where is it at? Window, where is it? View, error list right there. View menu, error list. Visual Studio has a powerful um, checker to check JavaScript code, HTML code, and CSS code and give you errors or warnings. Ooh, I get some three scary problems here. Technically, they're warnings, which are not so bad. You can live with warnings. No errors. That's good. If you're getting errors, that's not good. But no errors are being shown. And here, then, it tells you what the error is, a clickable link to further give you even more detail of what the error is, but it's way too much information. It's telling you in which project, which file, which line. You can double click to take you there exactly. This is a warning. Unnecessary semicolon, line 46. We've never written semicolons at the end of our functions, so we're going to leave that right there. Take that out right there, and when I save that, that then fixes one of the issues in the in the checker here, right? I change that other one, save it, and then took that one away. Now again, they're warnings, not errors, so it's not going to be too bad if I leave it. Um, if I leave it there, but if it really bothers you, I can say, don't show me warnings. That's not the best solution, but you can do that there. Okay. So that error checker right here is going to be very useful, especially when I make mistakes. You know, if my, if my code is misspelled and stuff, uh, it's telling me something's happening on line 48. Sometimes it's not exactly telling you like like here, like what's what's my mistake that I made here on line 48? Let me zoom in. I misspelled function, I'm missing a T, but that's not exactly what it's telling me. It didn't say you misspelled function. Unfortunately, there is no you know error checker in, in most software that can <coughs> fully check every single error because Syntax errors are easy to fix. Logic errors are a lot harder. Technically, here, I'm using this function. It, technically, that is kind of correct. It, it's fully correct that I'm saying, let's define this function. Uh, but here it's thinking, OK, well, you mean that, and then you mean a semicolon. So let's put a semicolon. But it's taking me in the wrong track. So it's not going to be perfect that it'll solve all of your issues but it will guide you toward your lines of code and and then you can fix them. So that error list. Uh, as we get more complex in the code, I'm going to recommend, uh, before you call me for help, I'm going to recommend look at your error list and see if you can figure it out a bit. And I'll come and help you, of course. But this has been so useful for us in the past semesters that when someone gets like a guide, go look at line 7. Oh, I misspelled it. And then they fix it. Um, this also works looking if you have it. This works on the files you have open. So if I have the index.html open, no problems there. Oh, actually, what's this? OK, yeah, this one. Problem, warning, not an error. If you open your index, it gives you a really scary warning. What, what's this warning about? It's saying, not found. That's bad, right? What's happening? It can't find that file. Well, it's this line. Um, 
line 25 here. It says we cannot find Cordova.js file. It's not in the folder. I already said it's not going to exist until we compile it. So in this case, this is a false positive, and uh, there's no way to say ignore this error. The closest is ignore all, not an error, a warning. There's no way to right click and say ignore this warning. You can ignore all warnings, but I wouldn't do that. Uh, so this one is just going to be there forever. You don't, there's no way to fix it really. You don't want to put a copy of Cordova.js there. Don't, don't do that. It does it for does does it by itself. It's just a weird warning that will always be there in your index J in your index HTML file. Just ignore it. Interestingly, and we'll deal with this next time. But interestingly, if you open your index CSS file, that's got a bunch of issues. Twenty six warnings, not errors. Warnings. Values of zero shouldn't have units specified. What does that mean? I click on here, margin zero pixels. Technically, zero is zero. You don't put any values. So I'm not going to worry about these because they're warnings. And if you are interested, you can click on these on the left, and it pops up to give you like the full gory details about what that is. It's going to be way too detailed. So the default template has these sort of like little quirks about using units in zero. It mentions this stuff about animation. If you're going to do animation, you want to use the Mozilla version of the code, also the WebKit or Chrome version of the code. So just ignore all of these. These are kind of interesting to look at. We'll deal with them next time. We're still just sort of getting uh, our feet wet with Visual Studio. It's a full-fledged code editor with code hinting, very powerful. You know, if I'm doing something in the CSS, like background color, Right here, I get a pop-up of all possible colors. That's nice. Dark khaki. <coughs> Perfect. And it gives you previews of images and all of that if you hover over um, in the, in the uh, Explorer. Here, it gives you pop-ups. So code hinting, error correction, remembers changes you've made. Here's another thing. Let's say I want to um, look at two different lines of code in my project. If you grab this divider and drag it down, it splits your current view into two views. So you see that little divider right, right above the up button? What's useful for that is you can look at line 1 of this file at the same time as looking at line 100. Then you just drag that back to the top to put it back. You can right click a tab and do separate views like we did with Notepad++. Show me the index.js in one screen and the CSS in another. And then you want to go even crazier, you can then split that up too. And do that like that. So I'm a super advanced programmer. Looking at four things at once. Save all. We've got, of course, undo, redo. We've even got jump back in, in history. Instead of pressing undo seven times, you have a history here. Take me back seven times. So very powerful software, very complex, very full-featured, technically demanding. You need a newer computer to run it the best. But now uh, we're going to start to use devices. When we come back next time, we're going to start to set up our real project for CBDB. We're going to create a brand new project, set up the config file exactly how we want, start setting up icons, set, start setting up our basic colors and such, then start to bring in our CBDB code from last week. To actually put it into our project and then continue. We're going to actually then see it work that it has the, uh, the auto login. Remember that wasn't fully working. It detected if you were logged in, but it didn't automatically 
change it to the section. That'll work once we're done with this uh, on uh, Thursday. So a lot to talk about, but remember, I'm uh, recording this. I'm going to have handouts. I put two more handouts into the folder I didn't talk about, but you want to look at them. Um, so here's our new direction. General questions on what we talked about today? So uh, there's nothing for me to save into the network folder. This test project, you can keep it if you want, delete it if you want. If you, uh, if you want to keep it, this is being saved inside of your My Documents folder, inside of computer, inside of uh, your folder of My Documents. You're going to see this, um, this project. So if you want to keep it, you can keep it. If not, you can uh, just turn off the computer and it'll be gone. But it's inside of my documents, Visual Studio 2017, projects. And there it is, blank Cordova 1.